Life Point Church, how y'all doing today? Come on, everybody. What a great morning. To all of you who came to the 8 o'clock service on Time Change Sunday, give yourself, come on, give yourself a little love. I'm proud of you. Come on, everybody joining. You made it on time. How many of you panicked a little bit this morning? I'm telling you, every pastor in America hates today. We all freak out. We're telling the whole staff, make sure we put an Instagram post about Time Change Sunday. So good job. And next service, all of your friends who normally sit by you will show up. So, hey, well, welcome to Life Point Church. My name is Mike. I serve here as lead pastor. If you're a guest with us today, we want to say a big welcome to you. It's Baby Dedication Sunday, everybody. I'm so excited. We're dedicating about 12 or 13 babies during our second and third services. And I'm telling you, you keep making babies, we'll keep dedicating them to the Lord. We just, we love our part, and I hope you love yours as well. Lots of cool things going on. Hey, whether you're joining us online, uh, that's funny. All right. Thank you. Whether you're joining us online, on demand, uh, on our app, however you got here, we want to say a big welcome to you and thank you for being a part of our services today, especially if you're a guest. If you take a moment and just text the letters LPC to the number 31996, we just want to follow up with a simple uh, message to you to get you connected here. And we just believe everybody in this church has a next step. And everybody in the church said amen. Every one of us has a next step. And I'm telling you, even as, seen, as lead pastor of this church, I got steps to take in my devotion to Jesus. That's actually our mission to lead people in their devotion to Christ. And until you stop breathing, you got steps to take in your devotion to Christ. Amen, everybody. I'm going to preach my guts out today. I'm just warning you now. I wrote too much sermon. I'm so excited about Psalm 23. Go ahead and get your Bible. We're going to jump in real quick. Uh, hey, I want to thank you again for your generosity to your church and your faithfulness in giving and and I always like giving you updates about how your giving is making a difference in the lives of others. But, but I want to tell you there are so many of you that are taking this step of obedience in this area of tithing. Back in February, we did this Dollars and Cents series. And I challenged any of you that, that aren't tithing yet, which is when we bring the first tenth portion to the Lord, right? I, it's the only place in the Bible that says, God says, test me in this area and see if I don't take care of your needs. So we offer this 90-day challenge. As well, and I feel so sales pitchy, you know what I'm saying? And, but many of you have taken the challenge. And, and I'm going to tell you something. Keep sending in your stories. I got an email this morning from a, a business owner who said, I, I've been in church since I was 12, and I was kind of lukewarm, and I, and I was in and out for a long time. And he said, I came to church, started coming this year, and, and he heard this challenge for tithing. And so in the middle of February, he was like, you know what, I'm going to test God. And he owns a business, and he said from uh, the fall, September till then, he, he's a business owner with clients. And he said, I'd only gotten about 13 clients. And he said... Um, and so I decided I'm going to tithe. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to tithe. And he said it was really hard because he tithed out of his business, right? And, and so how many of you know when you're a business owner, that capital is precious. You need it to run your business. So he tithes as a business. And, and he said that week his business doubled. And he goes, I was going to test God in tithing. And he goes, I'll never not tithe. Praise God. It's doubled his business. And he said his wife looked at him kind of like this. Ha, ha, I told you. So... <laughs> I'm just, hey, keep sending those stories. We love to tell those stories. But, but for all of you that are taking that step, I know it's a, it's a big step to take to become a tither because you're, you're really trusting the Lord in a very precious area to you. And I just want to tell you, God will meet you there. He's good to you. He's faithful. And I promise you he's going to come through. I, we've offered this 90-day tithe challenge for 10 years, and no one has ever showed up to my office to get their money back. No one. Now, I don't know if they left the church or got mad. I don't know. But no one has ever that's kind of the secret that I don't always tell. No one's ever gotten their money back because God has always proven himself. Isn't that great news, everybody? Hey, so uh, also in January, we do 21 days of fasting, and we partner with Convoy of Hope to provide clean drinking water. So we say, hey, whatever you're fasting, just give that money uh, towards whatever you would have spent on coffee or meals or whatever towards clean drinking water. And uh, I'm really excited. All the money's finally, we feel like, is matriculated in. And so we're writing a check tomorrow for $165,000 to Convoy of Hope. Your giving made that happen. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And listen, it will immediately go out into water filters. It's not going to sit on shelves or in the stockyard at, at Convoy. It is, there is a place for it right now. In fact, LifePoint, you guys are leading the way for a new initiative for Convoy. They're literally starting a whole new area of, of uh, their their compassion work because of your giving to clean water. Over the last three years alone, you guys have given just to water $415,000. So good job to you over the last three years. It's a big deal, and you need to know that 
But it's also making a difference in Clarksville. Sometimes people want to know, like, okay, good, we're doing clean water in Africa, but what about here? And uh, Convoy has, has gotten to know Miss Sherry and the YAPAC team, and they, they love them and what they're doing. And so uh, last month, they sent a couple cases of these, which are another one of their water filter options, which is a water bottle with the filter built in for the homeless population here in Clarksville. And so we are able to, through your giving, you are making a difference right here in Clarksville. And so the homeless, those that, that Sherry and the Apex team are serving uh, can get clean drinking water and access to clean drinking water. Here's one of our guys that, that got clean drinking water because of your giving right here. And I texted him last week and I said, we're running out of these and we need more. So they're going to send more uh, cases of these to Life Point or to Yapax. And so Sherry, to your whole team, thank you for what you do in this city. And we're so honored to partner with you. And Life Point, your giving is making a difference right here in town. Can I hold that for me? Thank you, sir. All right. Hey, get your Bible and go to Psalm 23. We're in week two of our Psalm series. How many of you blessed by Psalm 1 last week? Come on, blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the place of the sinner, sits in the seat of the scoffer. How many of you really reevaluated your week last week, right? I mean, did you not notice our temptation to walk, stand, and sit with those outside of the counsel of God? Amen? Okay, I'll just amen myself. Y'all don't do it. I got it. Thank you, online crowd. Uh, I love the passage last week. I think it's a great setup for the whole series. Next Sunday is Psalm 73, and then the week after that, we're going to finish out with Psalm 51. We saw last week that that we are to delight in him, to be grounded in him, and that the blessing of God comes in our relationship with him. It's not so much that, that we get stuff from God, but it's that we find contentment and groundedness and a centeredness in our relationship with the Lord. Today we're looking at Psalm 23, probably the most well-known of all the Psalms. The Psalms, it's the one on doilies in your grandma's kitchen. Come on, it's the one we all know. And, and I preach it every time, I read it every time I do a sermon at a funeral. But I've titled the message, Our Good Shepherd. Uh, let's read it together, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me, you should underline that by the way, makes me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me Besides still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. By the way, notice the difference from third person, second person, first person. He goes, the Lord is my shepherd, third person, he. Then he says, even though I walk, first person, he's, he's really personalizing this. And then he says, you, God, prepare a table, second person, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And then my favorite verse of the whole Old Testament, honestly, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, would you speak to us through this powerful psalm? It's the most famous psalm for a reason, and I pray that, God, today this psalm would become life-changing for us in new ways in Jesus' name. Amen. I love the 23rd Psalm. I love the imagery of God as my shepherd. If you've never studied sheep and shepherds, it's an interesting study. I think all of you should maybe just Google kind of what, are the, what is the interplay between a sheep and a shepherd. Sheep need guidance. They're herd animals. A lot of pastors joke at how uh, innocent and how naive and how dumb sheep can be. Sheep need guidance. They, they need the shepherd. They're herd animals. They need one another. They will follow the voice of their shepherd, and they will also follow the physical lead of their shepherd. They, 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 it's a really interesting dynamic between this herding animal and the human, and it's unique how God designed that relationship to play out. Shepherding is dirty work. It's messy work. It's long hours. It's really lonely. Shepherding is great for introverts, but rewarding in the sense that the sheep are well cared for, that the sheep are sustained and and they're nourished and they're cared for because of the relationship they have to the shepherd. Without a shepherd, the sheep are at risk. Without a shepherd, sheep can be isolated. Sheep can be at risk of, of disaster, of drowning, of predators. Sheep need shepherds. It's a really interesting interaction that God 
designed between human shepherds and herds of sheep. Now, I bet none of you have sheep. Any shepherds in the house? Anybody watching? Okay. So um, you may not understand this relationship really well. Another great uh, parallel is probably the relationship between you and a good dog, like a Labrador. Or we just got a dog, Stella, and I named her that so I can yell out her name from the front of my porch when she's, Stella. <clears throat> but you, the, the connection between you, that's a play reference, by the way, Streetcar Name Desire. Between you and a good dog, not a bad dog, a good dog, they know your voice. They know you physically. How many of you know a good dog appreciates when you come home? They're happy when you're there. You could swat a dog, discipline a dog, and they wag their tag, wag their tail right back at you, and they come right back. You give them a little, they jump up. They know the voice of the shepherd. They know the, they know the voice of their owner. They love when they see you. They're always happy to see you. Honestly, the imagery of sheep and shepherd is not as familiar to us in 21st century, but a good dog and a good owner makes more sense. By the way, the opposite of this close and friendly relationship would be between a human and a cat. I'm just saying, they don't care about you. They don't come when you call. They don't, they're never happy to see you. They glare at you when you say their name. They look back like, did you just, are you talking to me? They always give you attitude like you called your mother-in-law out by her first and middle name. They always, sassy. So that's not the same animal, but a good dog. David's writing that the Lord is our shepherd, therefore we are his sheep. Now I want you to take the role of sheep today. I want you to take the role of follower of the good shepherd. It's not an exact parallel, obviously, because we're humans. I've coached this, uh, this psalm to me is, is great coaching for pastors. It's a model of how to pastor people. The difference between sheep and humans is Humans have will, and they talk, and they have issues and everything else. So do sheep, but the parallel is not quite the same. We talk back. We have opinions. But basically what David is saying here is we are to be like sheep to our shepherd. We are to be guided and led and loved and cared for and tended by our good shepherd. But David's representing the idea that we are to follow God's voice. We're to follow God's lead. We're to trust where he takes us. I want you to go find a story of a group of sheep rallying against their shepherd going, we don't like this field. You'll never see it happen. But there's something about God being our good shepherd and leading us to places that we may have never been before or doing things that we've never done before or going down paths and trails that we've never walked before, but yet there's always a confidence that our, ship, our shepherd is with us and we can trust him and we can follow his lead. David's representing this idea that we are to follow his voice, his lead, his word, his guidance, and that God himself desires to speak to us and guide us into his goodness. Psalm 23, found in the Old Testament literally hundreds of years before the gospel of Jesus. But we can take it a step further because of Jesus. In John chapter 10, he actually says, I am the good shepherd. Listen, if you want to be shepherded well by God, you need to be intimate in relationship with Jesus. He said, now I am the good shepherd. He's not just some, it's not just God the Father generically shepherding the people of God. Jesus is saying, now I am taking this role of shepherd in your life. And everything I say is for your good. And everything I lead you in is for your good. And how I direct you is for your good. He said, I'm the good shepherd. Notice he's not an abusive shepherd. He's not a manipulative shepherd. He's not a nagging shepherd. He's a good shepherd. And look what he says. The shepherd, the good one, lays down his own life for his sheep. Man, we serve a good shepherd who has modeled good leadership and sacrifice. This imagery is important because this imagery carries into the church family. See, Psalm 23 was written during the time of the Old Covenant. And then Jesus appropriated this language into his ministry, but it carries into the church family. In fact, as a pastor, my prayer is that God would help me lead for you and care for you well. Our whole staff is here to help you be cared for as the sheep. And I look at this passage as a model for how to pastor. In fact, the word pastor, my title, is connected to the idea of a shepherd in a pasture. That's where the word comes from. The idea of pastoring is shepherding a pasture, a flock of people. So you are the sheep of this church, and I get to be your shepherd. How many of you know I'm not the good shepherd? Jesus gets that title. I just work for him. 
I'm the okay shepherd. That's my goal. I just want to be the okay. How's your pastor? Yeah, he's okay. Don't ever say, oh, he's really good. That's Jesus. How's Pastor Mike? He's okay. In fact, in the theological world, we say uh, senior pastors, local pastors are under shepherds. We're under the good shepherd. I work for Jesus. He's the pastor of this church, actually. I can prove that because one day I'll die or leave, hopefully by like, de- like I'll preach a sermon and walk off the stage and die. That's how I want to go out. Just like preach my guts out and then go die. It's tragic for you. Great for me. <laughs> but the Lord will bring another shepherd because it's his church and he'll make sure that his sheep are cared for. Please don't ever put your confidence too much in a local pastor because Jesus is the pastor of this church, not me. Come on, somebody. All right. So let's walk through this passage I was hoping for a few more, oh, no, don't go, nothing. (laughs) Steph, let's just roll out. They don't even care. (laughs) She's sad. She's like, no, I love it here. All right, let's stay focused. Here's what you need to see, first of all, in this passage. We're going to walk through Psalm 23. I'm telling you, I love this song. Watch. Wait till the end. We're going to get wrecked up here in a minute. But our good shepherd leads us. It's one of the problems that I think we've really not been able to pinpoint in the last 12 months is we don't have good leadership in our culture right now. Now, Let me just wax eloquent on this for just a minute. There is a difference in leading voices and leadership. And we got a ton of leading voices. We don't have any good leaders. And here's here's the difference. Leading voices will lead you to them and to their message, and to their good. Leadership leads you to your good, to your place of peace. Watch the passage. Look at this, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Look what he says. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Who's the green pasture good for? The shepherd? Shepherds don't eat grass. Sheep do. Notice the good shepherd puts us in a place of our provision. Look at this. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You know, for a sheep to get into running water is certain death because their wool gets weighed down and they can't swim because they got little stick legs and they end up drowning in this running water. But a good shepherd puts us by still water so that we can be nourished, so that we can be provided for. And listen, leading voices will put you by tumultuous water and say, come on, get in this drama with me. But a good leader puts you in places of peace and places of provision. One of the problems in our country right now, one of the problems in Western civilization is we got tons of leading voices and we don't have any good leaders. I mean, I've had people over the last year harassing me as a pastor to take up arms with their fight and take up arms with their drama and their conspiracies and their theories and their politics. And I'm going, look, if it's not leading the people of God to green pastures and still waters and the restoration of their souls, that's not my job to lead people to places of drama. It doesn't matter how much I agree with the politic, how much I agree about the vaccine, how much I agree about what's happening socially. My job as a pastor is to lead God's people to places of peace and provision and nourishment. And that's what God will do for you. So you got to ask this question. I'm not even on my notes. You got to ask this question. If you're spun up and stirred up, has it been God who's led you there? Or has it been leading voices who have deceived you that maybe looked like a shepherd, but they weren't a good shepherd? He leads us to green pastures. Look how it starts. The Lord is my shepherd. First of all, we all need to personalize this. Everybody say, God is my shepherd. You need to say that again and believe it. Say, God is my shepherd. Some of you have no concept of God actually caring about you. You think God only loves the pastor or God only loves the really disciplined Christians. That's called bad religion. David was a derelict at times. Are you kidding me? David was a total nutcase at times. David, some psychologists have studied David's psychology and think he was bipolar or had some kind of psycho, psychopharmic kind of issues. His highs and lows were drastic. And yet David would say, but God is my shepherd. Hey, guys, everybody, look at me. Look at the real me, not the screen me, except on screen. God loves you so intimately. He's not not withholding 
his shepherding because you're not always a good sheep. He's actually leaning in more when you're a bad sheep. Oh, I had to do it. I had to do it one time. I had to do it once. Stop laughing. He leans in more. Listen, here's the imagery of a sheep. When, when, a, she, when a sheep gets away, you, you remember this? <laughs> you remember Luke 15 when Jesus talks about when the one gets away, a good shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one. He doesn't go, I got 99 more. He doesn't say, let the wolves have that one. In fact, when we stray, the shepherd has to work harder. The job of a shepherd is to go after the one and then to carry the one around his neck for a season so that the shepherd regains intimacy with the voice of the shepherd. Some scholars have even said like the, the role of the shepherd when a sheep is constantly straying is the shepherd will break a leg on that sheep. And you think, well, that is so criminal. That's horrible. PETA would be furious. See how I let that go? I just kept going. Aren't you proud? I had PETA jokes all day. But if you have a broken leg on a sheep and a shepherd, your job now is to carry that sheep. Because if that sheep's going to keep up with the, she the, sh the other sheep, you're the one that has to carry it. But the purpose of carrying that sheep is to constantly talk to that sheep. Some of you might be walking through brokenness right now, and God's just going, I'm just trying to get your attention back. I'm just trying to get close to you again. I'm just trying to speak into your ear. Your life may be slowed down. You may have lost a job or you may be disappointed about some brokenness going on in your life. But God is so good to you that he's going, I will use this for your good. I will lean in harder and closer to you than when things were going great and you're just one of the pack sheep just rolling around like things are great. Look what he says. He will make us lie down in green. Boy, this is where humans get all messed up with this sheep imagery because don't make me do nothing. We don't want to be told what to do. We don't want to be made to do anything. In fact, people fight their church over this kind of stuff. I don't like what they do at that church. It's just blah, blah. They're making me go through growth track. They're making me do next steps. Look, we will never ask you to do anything in this church that's not a green pasture for you. But it's human nature to fight. Don't make me do nothing. It's a free country. You ever make your kids go to bed? You know that fight? Any parents hate that fight? Come on, be honest with me now. Any parents hate the fight of making your kids go to bed? Is, is not bedtime World War III in most houses? You know nap time when your kids are real small? And what do the kids always do? They kick and scream, I'm not tired. I'm not tired. <laughs> They're out. There's something about good shepherding that makes us lie down in places that are good for us and leading us to still waters. And look what he says. He restores our soul he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. God's desire to be very involved in your life, in your provision, in your needs being met, in the direction of your life, in your soul care. He just wants to be a part of your wholeness. You know why? Because he's the good shepherd. Look at the details here. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He doesn't just lead the pastor. He doesn't just lead the good Christians. He leads you to still waters. Evaluate your situation. Evaluate your life. Just think about where you're at. Are you in a place of provision and peace? Are you in a place of stillness? And look, I get that life is troublesome and, and the waters churn. But as you're even in drama and as we're in a pandemic here and as things are difficult... Are you centered on the things of God? Do you sense the presence of the good shepherd? Think about your life, relationships, your choices. If you're wondering, has God led me here? Just consider, are your needs being met? Are you at a place of peace? Is your soul okay? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Is this making sense to you guys? As he leads us, our soul is restored. We're forgiven. We're at peace with God. We have calm in the face of stress. God, our good shepherd, will lead us to places of provision of peace, of calm, and he will lead us on the paths of righteousness. Look what it says. That makes his name great. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Now, our world says, do whatever makes you happy. Our culture says, man, be your best you. Like, broad is the way that leads to God. All roads lead to heaven. You know, Jesus talked about this. Jesus says, narrow is the way and hard is the path that leads to righteousness. Some of us 
hate the path God's taken us down. But if, if it's a path for your provision and your peace and your righteousness, well, nobody else is doing this kind of way. Nobody else is praying every day. Nobody else is coming to church 52 weeks a year. Nobody else is serving on a dream team in my neighborhood. Well, this is a different path of righteousness, and it makes his name look good in your life. Come on, right? Amen. A good way to evaluate if we're in step with the shepherd, it's not a matter of whether or not we're in the wilderness. It's not a matter of whether or not we're facing difficulty. But do we sense his presence in our lives? Do we sense the peace from God that even in difficult times, man, I've got the shepherd with me. In fact, in fact, we see his protection and direction. Look at this, the very next verse. Verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you, God, you are with me. Man, I'm going to tell you, during this past year, everyone has had differing opinions and views about the valley of the shadow of death. I did two funerals last week. I mean, the valley of the shadow of death is ever among us. We've got folks in every walk of life dying from this virus that we're facing. All of you that have signed up to be in the military and serve our country and fighting, you, you live with the threat of the valley of the shadow of death. David knew this valley very well. As a lonely shepherd, there's stories of David in the shepherding field in these valleys fighting off lions and bears David knew this valley as a young, anointed, soon-to-be king in the books of Samuel who was being hunted down by King Saul, threatened with his own death by a maniacal king who wanted him dead. David knew the valley of the shadow of death. David understood the valley of the shadow of death as a warrior and a leader of Israel's armies who had conquered many nations in battle. He knew it as a, a young shepherd. He knew it as a soon-to-be king. He knew it as a, as a warrior in battle. He knew the valley of the shadow of death. All of us know that. We're living with this looming fear right now in our culture of the valley of the shadow of death. Who's going to be the next person to get COVID? Now they're, they're saying strains of COVID are, are changing and becoming more contagious, and people are living in fear. Look at David's attitude. Even though I walk through that valley. Look what he says. He didn't say, God, you'll take me out of the valley of the shadow of death. He said, even though I walk through it. I won't fear. Why? Because you're with me. There's something about taking sheep through dangerous places. There's something about a good shepherd taking them through what seems like a dangerous pass or a dark valley. But knowing that the shepherd is with us is what keeps us from living in fear. Hey, look at me, church. None of us should be living in fear. None of us should be living in fear because the presence of God, our good shepherd, is with us always. Every time David faced his own mortality, every time he was threatened with the end of his life, David knew that God, his shepherd, was close by and he could rest in knowing the presence of God was close. This wasn't just good theology for David. This was an intimate fellowship and a walk with God that David had cultivated over years and years of worship and showing up in his prayer closet and doing life with God. Paul had this attitude. He said, whether I live or I die, I live for Christ or I live with Christ. What is there to fear when God is with us? Listen, this verse literally was a passage I prayed over one year ago when I was quarantined. A year ago today, we shut our church down for 15 weeks. Today was the Sunday that we closed our church for 15 weeks. Two days later, I was called and said I had been contacted, contracted COVID. I'd been in the room with somebody and I needed to quarantine. I was one of the first people in Clarksville to get COVID and to have to quarantine. And I remember in those moments, and we didn't know what this virus was about. We didn't know the survival rate. We didn't know anything about it. And I remember being alone in my basement in moments of prayer. And sometimes I was nervous. Sometimes I was busy. Sometimes I was just exhausted. But I remember praying this passage over my life. God, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid of this. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to choose to believe, God, that you are with me in this valley. We didn't know what this virus could do. We didn't know what was happening culturally. We hadn't even begun to see the, the violence and the looting and the political unrest of our nation even though I walk through this valley, I'm not going to fear. Paul's attitude is if I live, I'm going to live with Christ. If I die, I'm going to be with Christ. How do you threaten a guy like that? How do, you, how do you put fear into somebody's eyes that has that worldview? Look what he says next. Your rod and your staff comfort me. 
Did I skip a verse? <laughs> oh, it's at the bottom. Even though I walk through the valley, shadow of death, I won't fear. And then he says, your rod and staff comfort me. Can I tell you, no sheep likes to be disciplined. Hey, sheep, this is when you say amen. No sheep likes to be disciplined. But the rod of discipline and the staff of relationship is to bring us comfort. This is the part of the job and the role of a shepherd that, that many church folks can't stand. They don't like their pastor to be honest or bring correction or say things that are too hard. Because we don't like the rod. But David's attitude is the rod is comforting. Proverbs 12 says, God disciplines and corrects and trains those he loves. This is the part of the job and the role of a shepherd to bring correction, to bring guidance, and to bring us close. The rod end of a a shepherd's staff. All of you have seen this. So a shepherd's crook has this curve at the top. This part would be more of the staff end, and the blunt end would be the rod end. And it's meant to be like a bottom of a cane. It's, It's blunt, and it's used to like smack the, the tail of, a, of the sheep to get them moving or poke them along to keep them going in the right direction. And sometimes your pastor needs to say some things and push some things in your life to help you keep going in the right direction. Can somebody say amen? amen. It's never fun for me. I don't walk around with a stick going, who can I smack? You know what I'm saying? Like it's never my attitude. But sometimes your pastor has to tell you some stuff that God says that's good for you and it keeps you going in the right direction. And I want to encourage you to take that as comfort. Take it as a God who loves you and a pastor who cares for you, that the the rod end of the staff comforts you. Can I tell you this too? The rod end of a staff is also the blunt end to use as a weapon of defense. That is to defend off thieves or predators. Knowing that the shepherd can not only discipline and train but can defend us should bring us comfort. It's why many of you feel comfortable with a self-defense weapon. It's the in case we need to defend, it brings us comfort. Then the curve of the shepherd's staff is intentionally designed to pull the sheep close. See, when the sheep start to stray from the the word of God and when the sheep start to stray from the voice of the shepherd, when the sheep start to stray into listening to other shepherds or or listening to to, to the fear of the other sheep even, it's the shepherd's curve on that staff that, that pulls the sheep back so they'll remain close to the shepherd. And that's what God does for us. When we begin to wander and to stray, he'll pull us back through his word. He'll pull us back through preaching at our church. He'll pull us back through our small group. This is why we read our Bible. This is why we faithfully attend church because every week we are drawn away from the voice of the Lord and we need our pastor and we need our good shepherd to just faithfully draw us back to the heart of the good shepherd. That's the pulling in of God every time. You get into the word of God, he's pulling you in. Every time you spend time in prayer, and you may feel like, my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. No, 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 God hears you, and he's pulling you into himself. Every time you connect to your church family in small groups and in church services, God is pulling you in, reminding you of his voice, bringing comfort to you. Sometimes you get in a small group, and they say some things that are blunt on your tail, aren't they? And they're hurtful, and they're corrective. And we go, I don't like that, but it's a comfort. And it's good for us that God would discipline us. Amen? Are y'all getting anything out of this? Because I feel like I'm preaching a lot to me. Okay, good. Being in church, reading God's word, prayer, these aren't chores or religious duties. These are comforting. And they keep us close to our good shepherd. Amen? Look what he says in verse 5. You, God, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Man, this is great. Listen. Here's what you got to get from this verse, because it's a lot. Here's, what, here's the bottom line. God has your back. God has your back. He'll defend you. You don't have to defend you. Shut down your social media warrior status. You don't have to defend you. God will defend you. God may even set up a table for you in the presence of the very ones who have attacked you. Just, just let God defend you. Let the shepherd care for you. Let the shepherd be the one who, even in the presence of enemies, puts an anointing on your life, puts the word of God in your mouth, puts the flow of God's spirit in you so strong that you don't have to say anything, but God himself will defend you against an abusive friend or a, a, a spouse that's gone the wrong way or people who are maligning you. Listen, we live in a culture that's so dang scrappy. Shh, let the shepherd defend, protect and care for you. I would rather have more anointing than more uh, annoying posts. 
and more victories. I'd rather have more anointing than more victories. So number one, our shepherd leads us to provision, to peace, to healthy soul, to righteousness. Second, our shepherd protects and directs us. And finally, this is my favorite part. Our shepherd relates to us. I've asked Elmer to come out in just a minute because I want to sing. We sang the 23rd Psalm this morning. And I want us to sing that again together in just a moment as we close. But I want you to see verse 6. This is my favorite part of the whole Old Testament. You ready? Okay, I have a lot of favorite parts of the Bible. I know I keep saying that. Steph's like, every verse is your favorite. Well, this is one of them. She doesn't really talk like that. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, just the English reading is pretty good. Surely, don't call me Shirley. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I don't know about you, but I just, I want that. I want to be marked by the goodness of God and the mercies of God. And, but this idea of following, is kind of like it's always behind me. I want it to catch up. You know what I'm saying? Like I want it to lead me. I want it to be on me. Don't just follow behind me. Be on me. Well, I want to just unpack this verse for you, in particular, goodness and mercy and this word follow. This is amazing. And you got to, this is where I love, like, I love the English Bible. This is why I preach from the English Standard Version because so often it does a good job from the original languages. But I want to dig in just a little bit and nerd out for you. Uh, this first part here, the goodness and the mercy of God. Uh, the mercy of God specifically, uh, this, this psalm was written in Hebrew. And the word for mercy is the word chesed. Everybody say that with me. Come on, say chesed. You got to get a little on your shirt if you're going to say it right. Not hesed, but chesed. Come on, try it at home. Chesed. Now, I called my old Hebrew professor from seminary, who is actually a Hebrew scholar, Dr. Wave Nunnally. He was scheduled to go with us to do our Israel tour that's been canceled for two years in a row. We're going to get there one day. He's a Hebrew scholar, studied at Hebrew University in Israel, literally fluent um, in ancient Hebrew as well as modern Hebrew. And we talked through this passage, and I can nerd out a lot longer if you want me to, but let me just tell you. This, this word, chesed, uh, it's a secular word in origin. It comes from the worlds of military, politics, and business. It was in large measure the ancient Near Eastern equivalent to the idea of the faithful keeping of the stipulations of a binding contract. So the chesed concept is we have a contract, and chesed describes the people who are faithfully keeping the contract. So it's not just a contract, but it's the faithful execution of the contract. Are you all hearing what I'm saying? So a contract is binding, and a contract stipulates what it means to be faithful to one another or covenant. In fact, it's, it's more equally connected to a, another Hebrew word, berit, which means covenant. But this, this, this contract, it's not only the faithfulness of a contract, but it's the faithfulness to keep the faithful contract. It's a double positive. In context of God and the Bible, chesed refers and reflects to the connotations, listen, of God voluntarily making a contract with us and then remaining faithful to his contractual agreement to the nth degree, even as we see to his own detriment, his own death, his death on a cross as a treaty or contractual term. The use of this term in Psalm 23 likely arises from David's royal period of life. He understood the value of going into covenant with other nations and being faithful to his word. How many of you know it's one thing to give your word? It's another thing to be a person of your word, right? Here's a better way of saying without nerding out. It's God's faithfulness to be faithful to us. Everybody says, well, God is faithful, and he's faithful to being faithful. He's not only good, he's good at being good. He's really good at being really good. It's a double punch of the goodness of God. It's like the, the double stack of the faithfulness of God. So here's what David is saying. Surely, goodness of God and the faithfulness of God to be faithful, not only is he a faithful God, but he's faithful in being faithful. Like, he'll never disappoint. He'll never have bad for you. God never has ill will for you ever. He's always got good for you. He's always got faithfulness for you. And he's always faithful to being faithful to you. And here's what he says. Surely goodness and chesed will follow me. Now, follow is another cool word. Because I'll be honest. Like, I know what it means to be a follower. It's always behind. I don't want the faithfulness of God being faithful behind me. I want it on me. And the faithfulness of God to follow, this is the word for follow. In the Hebrew, it's the word radaf. Everybody say radaf. That's not as messy, is it? Back to Dr. Nunnally. Radaf 
Now, now chesed comes from David the king keeping covenants, keeping contracts. Radaf comes from the outlaw warrior part of David. It comes from the, it comes from the scrap, scrapper David. Y'all knew David was a scrapper, right? This is because outside of Psalm 23, this verb exclusively appears in military contexts. And here's what radaf means. It ain't just follow. The word radaf means to pursue as in an army that has its enemy on full retreat and is now in hot pursuit, and its ultimate goal is to surround and completely overwhelm the fleeing army. So listen, the faithfulness of God to be faithful does not just follow behind, but he violently pursues you with the direct intention of surrounding you with his goodness, surrounding you with his faithfulness, and overtaking you with his faithfulness. It's like a father chasing his little kid going, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, and the kid's going, And what happens is once you get close enough, the kid, what, relents and tightens up and full of glee accepts the capture of the father who then just pours his goodness on that kid, tickles the fire out of that kid, kisses all over that kid. That's God's intention for you, to violently pursue you with the full intention of overtaking you with his goodness and his goodness to be good, his faithfulness to be faithful, his mercy and his goodness is tracking you down. He will never stop chasing after you and he intends to grab all of you. It's not just his goodness behind you. He's chasing you down. Man, I'm praying. I got a friend right now who's running from God and God's chasing him. He's running from God. He's called to ministry and he's literally abandoned family and assignment of God and he's completely living out of God's will. I told him last night. I called him texted him. I said, hey, I'm preaching Psalm 23, and verse 6 is for you. God will never, ever, ever stop being in hot pursuit of you. You know why? Because he's a good shepherd, and he's your good shepherd. He never gets to a point with you where he's like, I tried with her. I'm done. Get her out of here. Man, he is in hot pursuit of you, And he wants to pour his faithfulness over you. Some of you have never experienced faithfulness because you've been let down your whole life. You've had people break their word, break promises to you. You've been let down so many times by culture and society and things didn't work your way. But that's not our good shepherd. And I'm telling you, the Lord is after you. He's pursuing you. Some of you just need to stop running. Some of you just need to stop being chased. You need to just pause and let the crook of God's word, let the shepherd staff of God's love and his church and his under shepherd that he's given you, let God just pull you in close and overwhelm you and overtake you and grab a hold of you and just pour his love all over you. Look what he says finally. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is our daily life with our good shepherd. This isn't just when I die, I'm going to heaven. That's terrible and incomplete theology. It's not terrible. It's incomplete. I don't want to just go to heaven when I die. I want to live like I belong to heaven now. Listen, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord today at 5 o'clock. Tomorrow at 7 a.m., Tuesday and Friday, next Sunday, I'm a, I'm a house of the Lord dweller forever. You know why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. I'm a son that he's chased down. I think through my own story. I think through my own life and what God has done to capture my heart, to capture my life, to do something with me. And I'm no more special than anybody else in this place. You are so special to God. He's in hot pursuit of you. And he wants every part of you to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This isn't just good theology. This isn't just the Bible. This is what we need to be convinced of, that our shepherd is good, that he is chasing us down, that this life is not just an afterlife, it's a today life. It's a dwell in the house of the Lord, every day kind of life. So I wanna do something different than what I even wrote, which half my sermon didn't get preached today. I preached a different one. Do I get anything out of this word today? So here's what I want to do. I want us to close 
together on our feet. Nobody leave. Come on. You know what? Can I just be your pastor for a minute with the blunt end of a stick? Stop leaving when I finish preaching. Poor Jordan comes up here every week. Hey, hey, before you go, before you go, real quick. Just stay for one more minute. Because there's some good news that he brings up. I don't bring him up here just to fill air. I bring him up here to do good for you. You're welcome. But before you scatter out of here, I've got to go get my kids. They're eating sugar. They're fine. I want to beat the traffic. Don't miss the moment with God trying to beat traffic out of his house. Are you kidding me? So just let's, let's stay for a moment and let's stand together on our feet. Hey, if you're watching, not driving, you may need to pull over for this one. But I want to lead us in a prayer. But before we do that, I want to sing this chorus, this verse again. We won't get into the, uh, the medley part, but this song. We sang, the Lord is my shepherd. Now that you've heard it preached, I want you to sing this like you believe it. I want you to sing this as confession to God. You ready? Come on, let's sing this. Sing it together to the Lord of heaven. Here we go. Come on, can we open our hands to the Lord and let's sing this together. He goes before me. Defender. Defender behind me. Say it. I won't Come on, we're just singing Psalm 23. I'm filled with anointing. Come on. I'm filled with anointing. Oh, overflowing, Lord. Come on, my cup. My cup's overflowing. No weapon. I will not fear God. No weapon can harm me. Come on, sing hallelujah. Come on, lift your voice. Sing it to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am not alone. Come on, wherever you're watching, stop what you're doing and sing this. He is. to the Lord. Through mountains and valleys. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. His joy is refreshing. Yeah. Come on, restore my soul. Yes, Lord. The mercy and the goodness. Come on, He's chasing you down. Thank you, Lord. That I'll see his glory. That I'll see his glory. Come on to your good shepherd. Last time. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your hands to the Lord. Sing it out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am not. God, we thank you for this psalm written that we may sing it so boldly, declaring, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord of heaven is our good 
shepherd. Come on, we don't fear death. We don't fear the shadow of death because we know that God is always with us. Our shepherd cares about what we care about. He takes care of our needs. You make us lie down in places of provision and peace. You mend up and you care for our soul. When we're tired and weary, you care and you see us and you know our every need. You lead us through your word. You lead us by your voice. You lead us by your spirit. And through your church, God, you lead us in the path of righteous living that we reflect your name so well. We know that to live this life is to live for Jesus. And we know that to leave this life is to be with Jesus evermore. Because you love us, Lord, you teach us and you correct us, you pull us close, you speak to us, you keep us there, you teach and correct us through your word, through your church, and through your spirit. God, pull us close to you, we pray. Draw us in, Lord God, so we may know you and walk with you and fear you and hear from you. God, you are our good shepherd. You cover us. You defend us, you anoint us, you're not distant. In fact, God, you are in hot pursuit of us every single day and you intend to take us over. So God, grab us up, have your way in us, overcome us with love and affection and mercy and goodness and faithful faithfulness, faithful faithfulness. Everybody say, God, I'm all in. Say, I believe in Jesus my good shepherd I receive the Lord Jesus I will walk with you and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever forever in Jesus name come on everybody sing hallelujah hallelujah one more time hallelujah hallelujah I am Come on, sing it.